Let's go. Uh, Joshua Nelson, back with you again. We're here today in the Cherokee Nation. We're on the grounds of the former capital of the Cherokee Nation. This is the current Supreme Court building behind me. And we're here today with uh, Cherokee Nation Supreme Court Justice Troy Wayne Poteet. Justice Poteet, thanks for coming. I'm glad to be here. Yeah, it's I appreciate time. you. Well, the first question that I think is going to be on everyone's mind is if you could tell us a little bit about the turban that you're wearing. These turbans are a symbol of that generation um, of Sequoia. They're most clearly identified with Sequoia, most often identified, I guess I'd say. And he never wanted to adopt European dress, although he became a world celebrity because he invented an alphabet or a syllabary. That particular generation were just a, a astounding because they managed to transition the Cherokee Nation, a loose band of villages connected by clan and language, into a, uh, a republic. They survived the forced removal and rebuilt the Cherokee Nation again. And I'll, uh, I'll take mine off, Professor. And uh, now these things are, are branded. Uh, I wanted one in my... Uh, wife said, what, what are you doing with that old hat and that piece of cloth? And I said, well, I, I want a hat that looks like Sequoia's. And she said, well, you're not going to wear that anywhere with me, so <laughs> I'll, I'll fix you one later. And uh, she sewed in the tribal sewing factory when she was a girl, and, so, and she's a math major and was accustomed to dealing with angles and measurements, and she figured out how to, uh, it took seven tries to get one of these that would tie up and you would be able to take it on and off. You know, if the minister wants to give the blessing mm -hmm. or the uh, flag comes by. Uh, and so we wanted something that looked like Sequoia's hat in paintings and none of these survived. Uh, one day I went with Dr. King at the Smithsonian and we went through all the archival uh, facilities and uh, couldn't find one. I got a but lot of head one, there to contend with. Do you? Yeah, it's a large one. Yeah. But I tell you what, these are good looking. Well, thank you. Yeah, and uh, we'll wear them for a while and then we'll take them off, I guess. But these conjure up images of that generation of Sequoia and they're kind of a symbol of Cherokee adaptability. Mm -hmm. We adapt, but we hold on to those things that are particularly Cherokee uh, mm -hmm. as as we go along and so they, these are a symbol of that that's yeah. a and they've uh, I've enjoyed uh, playing with them and uh, so thanks for asking professor. oh yeah absolutely you're looking good in that yeah, thanks <laughs> oh, if I look half as good as you I'll be doing good uh, I remember hearing a story about uh, how we started wearing some of these and, and from what I recall it had to do with the trip that several of the chiefs made over to England and back in the old days, I guess we used to shave our heads, have a little top knot in the back there, and do some tattooing. And uh, I guess some of the courtiers were a little alarmed about how the king might uh, respond to something like that. That, uh, the former Miss Cherokee, Virginia Stroud, uh, who's a very talented, award-winning artist, uh, told me about the research she did for a painting that hung for a long time at the... Uh, tribal casino in Catoosa. And she said that when they were looking through the documents in the Royal Archive, she found this correspondence. What had happened was, is what, what you say, the Cherokees had these big roaches, tattoos, they looked wild, and the King's courtiers said, oh, they're just much too uh, uh, savage looking for old King George <laughs> to continents. And so there had been a delegation from the subcontinent, from India, those guys, they had changed out into court wear. I think it was red coats with gold buttons and whatever was in style in Britain at that time. Well, they dressed the Cherokees up in this garb and presented them to the king, and the Cherokees liked that garb. They thought that was the uh, pretty neat stuff. So in a few weeks, the uh, king's ministers write letters to their handlers and say, when are you gonna bring back the oriental attire? And Virginia Stroud told me that 
those f folks handling the Cherokees wrote back and said, well, in a week or two, but the turbines won't be coming back. The chiefs are attached to them. Well, one of the fascinating things, and one of the reasons that I'm really grateful that you're here with us, is besides being one of the justices on the Supreme Court, you spend a lot of time digging into Cherokee history. And uh, I'm always fascinated by the turban. It's such a, a, a beautiful looking symbol. But like you say, it's a symbol of a time too. And at the same time, coming from that kind of tradition, it's a symbol of diplomacy, right? Uh, of these folks being in conversation with other nations, uh, with, or in this case, with other empires, uh, with the king. Um, but you're right too that that moment in time was one of the most powerful for Cherokee folks. And as you say, it was that, that generation that crafted the Cherokee folks, the Cherokee people, into a nation. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how the court came about during that time. Right, in the, in the time of Sequoia. Now, it wasn't in the time of the guys that brought them home, but in the right. Sequoia who, it's and in that, right, right, in that, in, in the 18, uh, early 1800s, I think it was, uh, we were a, a, chain, a society in flux. Of course, everybody's always evolving, but because of European contact, we had begun trading uh, and work entirely dependent on a subsistence economy. We had grown accustomed to pots and kettles, uh, firearms, and there had been generation after generation, uh, even from the, uh, the s mid, late 1700s, European traders. For instance, Ludovic Grant came into the Cherokee Nation and married a Cherokee girl. And his daughter married William Emery, another, an English trader, I think he was. And their child married uh, the Indian agent. Mm -hmm. And their son was the first justice of the Cherokee Supreme Court. Really? Be, there was a group of people who spoke English, understood uh, the society that was encroaching on Cherokee territory understood what those people were about, yet they completely understood Cherokee culture, and they had no other Cherokee, uh, no other nationality. They were the sons of traders who left their country and for practical purposes became Cherokee people. You got Cherokee citizenship matrilineally from mm -hmm. your mother. So these people uh, had no, they were a great deal of European blood, but no European alliances. They were Cherokees. Right. They gravitated toward leadership and began to try to figure out how to protect property. And the main property they wanted to protect was the tribal land base. So through a series of trade treaties, trying to get along with the encroaching Europeans, Cherokee people had given up 90% of their land base by 1817. And there was problem because of the we were a loose band of villages and authority wasn't centralized so some rogue chief might sign away land and something had to be done about that situation so I think it was 1817 they formed a committee council uh, a governing body and through the years I think it was in 1823 they formed a court they set aside a separate entity to make decisions, and then in 1823 they established an appellate court. So that was the start of the Supreme Court. Now, they established district courts, and they had a level of judges that were described as like justices of the peace, and then for every two of those there was a, a circuit judge who tried more uh, difficult cases, mm -hmm. murder and cases involving lots of money. And 75% of the cases through the years have dealt with economic matters mm -hmm. because we begin to accumulate property right. like, like our neighbors in the South. So we, we were a, a changing society. Now, a lot of the traditional people who weren't uh, concerned with accumulation of property so much they supported the kind of government that was being created mostly by the mixed-blooded, uh, what's been termed the elites, the people who could speak English and understood the encroaching society, uh, because they understood that it was necessary to protect the land base. So by 1827, 
our ancestors had the audacity to uh, call a constitutional convention and declare sovereignty and power to rule over the territory guaranteed them by the latest federal treaty, which was 1817, 1819. And, of course, the Georgians went ballistic. You know, they just had a conniption fit. Uh, and it didn't help anything at all, Professor, because at that same time, just almost the same year, gold is discovered. Mm -hmm. And so our borders are overrun, and it exacerbates the problem and hastens the Congress to pass the Indian Removal Act. And uh, part of what happened in those years, too, was the Cherokees, they were accustomed to settling some kind of disputes with another town or with the Creeks by saying, let's don't kill each other and have a battle. Let's have a stickball game. Mm -hmm. right. And whoever wins, that settles the matter. They win the argument, and everyone abided by that. And so Cherokees had a notion that since we're right, and we know they're right, we're right, even by the white people's standards, according to their laws, if we win in the courts, well, then we've won. 